You cannot beat Tesla, I will tell you right now. Tesla cannot be beat. In Tesla, you know what new is? It's the same new you get in your smartphone. Who here has an Apple iPhone? Okay, right? No, I don't. You got an iPhone, right? <laughs> what, it, what has changed about the iPhone since the iPhone 11? If we're looking in the old way, the new color, the new shape, the new... Get rid of the... Chip and software. Basically nothing. Chip and software. In Tesla, do you know how you get your new car? Through software updates. I own a Model S. I have a 2022 Model S, which I've had for 18 months. Jared has a Model 3, which he's had for a couple of months. So I checked this actually yesterday. Since January of 2022, I've received 19 updates that included 41 additional features. Right? Here, here's my point. My point is, is that with each technological iteration, we redefined the art of the possible. Right, one of the biggest, all, all of you have been, I've been in my career for 25, I started in 99. So whatever that is, 24 years. I've been in this industry 24 years, okay? When I was young, straight out of college, I knew nothing. And the advantage to knowing nothing is that I didn't self-limit. So I didn't know that 10 years ago we tried to do that. So I suggested it again, right? And what did all the old guys tell me? We already tried to do that. We tried to do that 20 years ago, it didn't work. Well, that works, it, that, that applies when each technological iteration takes 40 years. The second industrial revolution started in 1900, give or take. The third industrial revolution started in 1969, 69 years later. The fourth industrial revolution started in 1998. That's not 69 years. And the fifth industrial revolution started in November of 2022. 24 years later. And guess when the sixth industrial revolution is going to start? 10 years from now. That is Moore's law. By the way, anybody who objects and says Moore's law only applies to transistors, they don't know what they're talking about. It applies to all technological innovation. Right now, there are people in here who own companies, right? You, you, you develop hardware, you create software. You guys are creating software, right? You're the CTO, you write code, right? Um, if I were to bring in 20 different chief technical officers to, to write the code you're writing, okay, what I would get is 20 different pieces of software that look completely different under the hood that do exactly the same thing. Okay? If you are in the business of writing software that way, you will be out of business before your software is done. That's the point. The point is, is the market will select you for death because you will never be able to write that code from scratch. They all do things differently if they're a legacy company. But the smart, innovative, transformative leaders realized, wait a minute. What we need to do is we need to turn our business, this circle, into a node in a much larger ecosystem. Me, Tesla, needs to be able to talk to St. Cobain. I need to have insight. St. Cobain makes the passenger windows, that makes the windows for Tesla vehicles. So if you have a driver's side door, a window, those are made by St. Cobain. How do most manufacturers do that in supply chain? They'll send an order, they'll get a lead time of 12 weeks. Where's that order? They get on the phone, hey, where's that order? Hey, where are my windows? Oh, they'll be there, we're shipping them tomorrow, right? Checks in the mail, a couple days later, oh, hey, cataclysmic failure, it's going to be another 12 weeks. Does that ever happen to Tesla? No. Why? Tesla has insight into the reality, the actual reality at St. Cobain. You know why? Because St. Cobain doesn't have a choice. To be one of their suppliers, you have to join their ecosystem. And their ecosystem is, is open. Why is it over the last five years, um, Toyota, General Motors, BMW, Ford, and uh, Josh, who owns, uh, who's the other, Daimler, um, have all stated that Tesla was overpriced, their stock was overpriced, that they weren't really all that special in the market, and that the market would ultimately catch up to them. All those companies said those things. 
okay? And today, the number one most popular vehicle in the world for Q1 of 2023 was what? The Model Y. The Model y. When was the last time a Toyota vehicle was not the number one selling vehicle in the world? 20 years ago? 30 years ago, 29 and 29 years ago. Not a single analyst, by the way, zero analysts, predicted the Model Y would be the best-selling vehicle in Q1 of 2023. Of 600 and something analysts, zero predicted it would be the best-selling vehicle in the world. Guess who knew it was already in March of Q1? Tesla. What I hope to leave everybody with when we leave today is where are we and what, what does the next year look like? Okay, and what should you do when you leave? Like at Raytheon? What should you do at Raytheon? You should go to Raytheon, go to the highest ranking person you know of, and ask them this question. What is our digital strategy? And when they go, uh, well, what the fuck does that mean? You go, what is our plan to make data the primary commodity in our business? That's what anybody who works for any manufacturer should do. If the highest ranking person you know says, I don't know what a digital strategy is, or we have no plan to make data our primary commodity, go get a different job. It is not that hard, I'm telling you, because you are working for a dying company. Um, last year when we talked about this, we talked about what does digital transformation look like for manufacturers? If they want to become like Tesla, what do they have to do? Well, they do it in two steps. Step one takes three to five years, and I'm going to show you a client that we did this for over a two-year period. Okay? But the first part of digital transformation is connect, collect, store, analyze, visualize. So connect to all the data, so PLCs and switches and telemetry. Collect the data, okay? And this is where unified namespace comes in. Collect it in a normalized way so that whether Matt is collecting it or whether Walker is collecting it or whether Alex Klein, if you look at any of our architects, if you go to our data infrastructures, that is the data that we're collecting for companies, they look exactly the same. I can take Matt and I can put him on a project somebody else is looking on and they know exactly what it looks like under the hood. It would be the equivalent of you having 10 different software developers and they could move back and forth between products and everything would always look the same. This is the advantage of GPT, by the way. It's the advantage of GPT. You can write your code however you want to and then you could put your code into GPT and you can say, give me the standardized way it needs to be written and then you paste it in. So now I have 10 different developers writing code exactly the same way. And by the way, the vast majority of people in software development, when I say that to them, you watch their eyes go, whoa, how did I not think of that? Well, Tesla did 13 years ago, okay? All right, well, what we've been doing is to connect, collect, store, analyze, visualize. What's been happening over the last year for these companies to become more and more digitally mature They've been finding patterns, okay? They've been predicting problems. They've been reporting what those problems will be, and they've been solving them, mitigating them, okay? And then the big step, the second big step, is digital supply chain. All right, so I'm going to show you an example of a client that we did. It was a dying, failing organization. He spends, I don't know, a couple, you know, 20 million maybe, buys the building and buys the facility. They bring us in. One of their engineers brings us in, calls me and Matt. Matt and I walk in, and they say, all we want you to do is take Kepware. Everybody, anybody know what Kepware is, right? So Kepware is a piece of software that talks to PLCs, and it basically allows us to connect all of our machines together in one network. Matt and I walked on the plant floor. We, we looked, and we were like, holy cow, they, I mean, they have state-of-the-art equipment here, and they're not talking to any of it. I mean, we're talking Siemens D445 motion controllers. I mean, some of their presses were $20 million presses. I mean, absolute state-of-the-art technology and they were totally blind. They weren't connected to any of it. So we say, you know what? We'll go ahead and connect your equipment together for you. We'll do that. But we want to propose something. We want to talk to your owner. So we go talk to the owner, this older guy, super fucking brilliant, does not screw around. He's the guy who yells at you and calls you dumb if you drop the ball. He's that guy. And I said, you know what I want you to do here? I, I'm going to ask you a favor. You have a $25 million printing press over there. and there is more value in the data in that press than you could possibly imagine. So what I want you to do is I want you to give me permission to connect to that machine and do whatever I want to it. I'll pay for it myself. I will show you 
what the art of the possible is. It'll take 12 weeks. It'll probably cost $25,000 to $40,000. I'll pay for it. We'll present in 12 weeks. If you like it, you buy it, and we do the rest of your facility. If you don't, we just pick up the server and leave. So we connected to that server. We connected to that press. We connected to a database that was on that press that they didn't know about. We connected to their shop floor system, which was like a homebrew SQL backend thing where they scanned barcodes. And after 12 weeks, we came back, and we revealed to them just how inefficiently their facility was operating. There were four operators that ran on that machine. We never talked to any of those operators. But the first thing that we did, we said, this is what the data has revealed to us. This girl right here is your best operator, and it's not even close. This guy right here is your second best operator. He's pretty good. This third guy has no idea what he's doing. And this fourth guy is your rogue guy. This guy his name was uh, Hector. And, and they said, Who, did you go talk to them? And we said, no. The data revealed that to us. They already knew that through their personalities. But we proved it with digital data, the, the efficacy of each operator. Number two, we showed them by connecting all this data together that none of their operators, they, they run hundreds and hundreds of products, or thousands of products, actually. And they may run a product, they may, run a, they may print a product in April of 2022 and not run it again for 18 months. We were able to connect together all the data on that press and show them that not, there were, this one product they had run 60 times, 60 times over a two-year window. They never once set the machine up the same way twice. Mm -hmm. The web tensions were never set the same way twice. The, the tunnel temperatures were never set the same way twice. Out of 60 production runs. So what we did was this is their journey, a two-year journey. Well, it's two-year journey to when we were really done. And we've been doing ongoing support ever since. We digitally transformed the whole organization on this one common infrastructure. I'm going to show you what their data looks like. They used to be a $25 million company. So they do $25 million in revenue per year. So the first thing that we did was we just put data on a screen that informed operators. Okay? Now, by the way, there's nothing fancy, but like, Randy, you could do this, right? You could, you could build this, right? You and I could get the same functional specification, and we would build the thing that looks the same, but it's totally different under the hood. The data, the way it's structured, all looks different. Okay? We don't do that. Our data always looks the same. So if you bring in an engineer and they look at this screen, an engineer from our company knows exactly how this is built. Oh, there's a namespace for this panel. There's a namespace for that panel. And there's a namespace for that panel. And there's a namespace for that panel. And then there's a namespace for how that window is built. So when we open the window, we actually read some data that tells us how to build the window. And then we, and then we connect the data to each of these little objects there. Our engineers would know exactly how it's built. And the reason that we're one of the fastest growing systems integrators in the world is because we develop that way. It takes us one hour for every other integrators, 10 hours. Okay? This and then a two year journey yielded a $25 million return. They spent a million dollars total, 900,000, I think it was, yeah, pretty close. over two years. And it, they doubled their revenue and profit at, at year two, 25 million to 50. And by the way, when we asked the owner of the company, how efficient were they? That is, at what efficiency level are you operating? Are you producing exact, as much as you possibly could? He said 80%. So he believed there was only 20% gain, and we gave him 100. 100% gain, totally blind. 